Hello again everyone, here's yet another video talking about Dune. I said in my previous Dune video that I'd be giving my thoughts about the actual movie in this video, but rather than a strict review, I wanted instead to discuss why I think this new version worked so much better as an adaptation than the previous attempts, why the creative decisions made by the filmmakers were so clever, and why some moviegoers maybe left the film feeling a little bit frustrated. Now, two disclaimers before I get started with this video. Uh, number one, I have a little bit of a cold, which is why I sound a little odd and bunged up. And number two, big spoiler warning, if you haven't seen Dune, I'd highly recommend you go see it, or read the book, or whatever, but I'm going to spoil the shit out of this movie, so if you haven't seen it, please take that into account. Okay? Off we go. So... First of all, when the credits of Dune rolled in the cinema, I certainly felt a little odd. I had to sit there in my seat for a little while, just kind of thinking things over, and came to the conclusion that really I just had to see the thing again. While I generally really liked the film, uh, some of the people I saw it with and others I've seen online left the cinema feeling a little frustrated. Dune is only half a movie, and I don't really decry anyone for feeling unsatisfied by the end, especially as, at the time, Part 2 wasn't officially in the works yet. But to those who feel that frustration, or even fans who have a more of a wait-and-see attitude with regards to Dune Part 2, I hope you'll indulge me in scratching the surface of this movie, because even though the Dune currently in cinemas it doesn't seem like a finished product, I think it's still quite brilliant. To explain why, let's go back to the beginning, and explain why Dune was considered for the longest time unfilmable. The reason Dune has been called unfilmable for so long has less to do with the story or plot being too weird or esoteric and more to do with the scale. At one point in time, The Lord of the Rings was also called unfilmable because of this reason. The resources needed to portray Middle-earth on screen were so vast that any adaptation would cost an exorbitant amount of money to begin with, and that's before we start talking about how to fit the sheer amount of stuff in that trilogy into a compelling cinematic narrative. Dune has had this problem for quite some time, but it also has the additional problem in that the narrative of the book doesn't really fit neatly into the expected three-act structure most viewers would expect from an epic sci-fi blockbuster. There are heroes and villains, in a way. Paul, for the most part, fits the Joseph Campbell arc, and there's plenty of action and visual spectacle to make any adaptation worth the price of seeing on the big screen. But there's also a ten-year time jump in the middle of the thing, and the plotting is filled with so many moving pieces, factions manipulating one another, motivated by decades if not centuries old goals which are tied directly to the very unique circumstances of this particular sci-fi universe, that the book ended up having an initial 100 pages where the reader has real difficulty following what the hell is going on. The opening chapters of the book throw so many strange-sounding titles and phrases at the reader that Herbert had to include a glossary in the back of the book. While this is certainly an inelegant solution to helping the reader understand the plot, any movie adaptation wouldn't have the luxury of pointing the audience to some extra material they could consult. In fact, for the original 1984 adaptation, Dino De Laurentiis actually made sure attendees of the movie's premiere were provided with pamphlets outlining the Dune universe and the backstory of the film they were about to see. And in the TV cut, they provided that extra prologue about the crusade against thinking machines and so on. This is coupled by the famous audible internal monologues which were present in the 1984 version, which more often than not tell the audience information they already are being shown by the direction and the acting, and also have the effect of severely damaging the dramatic tension of many scenes. The Sci-Fi Channel miniseries, which came later, does get around this problem just by making some clever changes. For example, the hunter-seeker, which attacks when it senses movement, explained to the audience in the 1984 original via the whispers of Kyle MacLachlan, is instead explained in-universe by Paul to one of the Fremen maids who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But the Sci-Fi Channel miniseries in a lot of ways had the opposite problem in not really having sufficient resources to properly render Dune on screen. The CGI of the time wasn't really up to the task and dates the series almost instantly, and the technique of using old Hollywood backlot style map paintings to depict the deserts of Arrakis is never all that convincing and kind of cringeworthy in certain shots. The size of Dune just doesn't come across on screen. The miniseries never escapes the feeling of being shot in a studio in Canada somewhere. Both of these adaptations though also suffer from a bit of a weirdness problem, and by that I mean weirdness which wasn't in the original source material. For example, in the 84 version, 
uh, they inject this motif of House Atreides having lots of pugs running around, and House Harkonnen, I mean, what's going on there? They're, like, milking cats, and the Baron has boils and sores, and the weirding way, as well, is turned into, like, this sonic weapon device, which I've always felt is a bit silly. The Sci-Fi Channel miniseries scaled a lot of this sort of weirdness back, but much of the production design and costumes are just needlessly flashy and really odd looking. Even the unmade adaptations like Jodorowsky's Dune have some truly strange concepts in them. I can only guess that the reason adaptations of Dune feel like they need to go in this weird creative direction with certain elements is because the Dune universe itself is in some ways a big departure from what many people expect from science fiction. The biggest sort of most recognisable pop culture iconography from science fiction most people think of comes from Star Wars and Star Trek. There is a pre-existing idea of what tropes should be present in sci-fi, like zipping around in spaceships at faster than light, there's ray guns, aliens, space battles, etc. But Dune sidesteps a lot of these. Dune is set so far in the future that human beings aren't really equipped to think of time on that scale, and yet many elements in this universe feel surprisingly low-tech. The absence of advanced computers, the focus on close quarters hand-to-hand -hand combat, and the majority of the action being confined to aerial and ground combat as opposed to space battles are all explained and make sense within the book, but getting into the details of why these expected tropes aren't present in Dune is seen as yet another hurdle any potential adaptation needs to clear. So, considering all these obstacles, the density of the universe, the protracted and intricate plotting, the weirdness factor, etc., why did this new adaptation of Dune work where all the others failed? First of all, they made it into two parts. This is where a lot of the frustration comes from from some viewers because the Dune movie, which is currently in cinemas, is only half the movie. With projects like The Lord of the Rings or Avengers Infinity War and Endgame, this probably wasn't as apparent because audiences knew the next chapters were already on their way, but it was only after Dune debuted that Part 2 was announced. If Part 2 never came, we'd be stuck with an adaptation that didn't have an ending. But this was absolutely a necessary creative decision. Compressing the entire book into a single movie as the 84 version did is a recipe for disaster. Entire plot lines and characters are either rendered paper thin or are missing entirely. Even the 2000 miniseries, which itself came in multiple parts, may end up being shorter than both parts of this new adaptation. By splitting the movie in two, the world building, plot, story, themes and characters all have far more room to breathe. Personally, I think as long as the film is, I would actually have preferred it be even longer. In my experience, audiences will happily sit through a three-hour film if it's a good one. The movie is still front-loaded with exposition, but it's been prioritised in a clever way which I'll expand on in a sec. Secondly, just fantastic visual storytelling. Denis Villeneuve is easily one of the best filmmakers working right now, and I would bet a large part of his involvement is why there's so much great visual storytelling throughout Dune. Those weirder elements I mentioned earlier which sidestep expected sci-fi tropes are virtually all handled visually. The personal shields and how they work in relation to close quarters combat is beautifully conveyed just in the colour scheme of the shields, blue when they're blocking and red when they're penetrated. The existence of Mentats making advanced computers redundant is made clear by them doing the funny eye thing when making calculations. The fact that most of the cinematography is confined to planetary surfaces with only a handful of space beauty shots makes us kind of understand how this sprawling empire operates and so on and so forth. So much of this universe is conveyed through the visuals that the viewer just gets it within a matter of seconds. There's no need for lengthy bouts of exposition explaining the history of the crusade against thinking machines. We're just able to understand at the very least the gist of all these things, which were previously thought to be too weird for the average moviegoer. But thirdly, this is Paul's story. Much like the trailers, the secret to Dune's success as an adaptation is that it chose to focus squarely on Paul Atreides and his journey. Plans Within Plans is often uh, quoted from Dune, usually referring to how intricate its plotting is, and safe to say, a lot of stuff happens in that book. Which is why the filmmakers took the smart approach in ignoring a lot of it for part one. Much like when Peter Jackson and co were adapting The Lord of the Rings, they had to find a consistent thread to anchor their adaptation, and they found it in Frodo's struggle as the ring bearer to reach Mount Doom. 
Amidst the hours of behind-the-scenes material for Lord of the Rings, one of the things Jackson said when they were making their final cut of each film was that if it didn't directly affect Frodo or the Ring, then it could be cut. This is the smart approach the filmmakers behind Dune also took. This is Paul Atreides' story. All of the world building and exposition is filtered through his perspective. Even the smaller details like the Fremen sandwalk is highlighted so Paul can use it later on. In this version, Paul is there when the Reverend Mother speaks to Jessica about the Kwisatz Haderach, and so on and so forth. We have an emotional anchor to structure the film around, which is something the 1984 and 2000 versions never really managed to pull off. Also, like Lord of the Rings, the filmmakers of Dune knew they wouldn't be able to fully resolve the plot in a single movie. Fellowship of the Ring ends with the ring still intact and on its way to Mount Doom, and part one of Dune ends with House Harkonnen still in control of Arrakis with the Emperor's backing. So Jackson and co made sure Fellowship, while not resolving the main plot, did resolve its own self-contained story, which did have a beginning, middle and end, and the same is true of Dune part one. Part one of Dune is about Paul Atreides' seizing his own destiny. True to the plans within plans motif, Paul is essentially a pawn, being used by a mix of different factions and individuals to further their own ends. For a lot of the film, he doesn't really have much agency of his own. He feels the pressure of being the heir to House Atreides, the Kwisatz Haderach for the Bene Gesserit, the target of Baron Harkonnen, and potentially even the Messiah of the Fremen. This is a story about Paul seizing his own destiny and becoming more than a pawn for others. In a way, Villeneuve pulls off a similar trick of cinematic language as he did with Arrival. In that movie, we kept getting glimpses of the protagonist with a daughter, and because of how this information is shown, we assume they're flashbacks, making the twist so much more impactful when they're revealed to be flash-forwards. In Dune, we see Paul's glimpses of the future, and from those dreams, we think we know what path the movie in its second half will follow, which is why him breaking with that path is so crucial. He disobeys his mother who wants to take him off-world, he fights a duel with and kills the man who his dreams told him would be his mentor, and he refuses to kowtow to the voices of the Bene Gesserit, which tell him to lose that duel. But Paul seizing his own destiny also has consequences to all those well-laid plans he was the subject of. Dune may only be half of a full movie right now, but it does manage to tell a full story about its central character. This is why I felt a need to watch it a second time. Being familiar with the book and the previous adaptations, I already know the full story, and I admit I was surprised when the movie ended where it did. I myself didn't feel fully satisfied by the end, but thinking it over and watching it again, I was able to more clearly see what made this adaptation so brilliant. In my previous Dune video, I broke down how the smart marketing for the film was able to entice a big enough audience to make it a box office hit, but here I hope I've illustrated how the filmmakers themselves were able to do the same on a story level. After waiting so long, I'm over the moon to see a definitive adaptation of this great book, and I'm happy to see so many newcomers being introduced to Dune for the first time. While I wish parts 1 and 2 were shot simultaneously like the most recent Avengers movies were, I'll certainly be just as excited to see part 2 when it finally arrives in 2023. Thank you for watching. If you like these videos, subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my patrons or my YouTube members where you can see videos early as well as some other exclusive content. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.